Well, hello everyone, and thank you so much for joining us at this virtual World Food Prize side event. This is a panel on transforming the food system through climate positive agriculture. I'm Anjali Merrick. I'm the interim global responsibility leader here at Corteva AgriScience, and I'm the creator of the Climate Positive Leaders Program. I just want to wish each of you welcome to this panel, and in particular, wish welcome to our wonderful moderator and our panelists who are joining us here today. Thank you for joining us and for sharing this time with us here. We have an exciting panel to talk about the role that climate positive agriculture plays in transforming the global food system. And we'll take a few minutes here to invite our panelists and moderators to introduce themselves and then jump right in. Julie, I'll hand it over to you. Um, it's an honor to be here, and I want to thank Corteva for including me not only as a uh, moderator, but also I got to be part of the panel that did the judging. So it was wonderful to see what all the farmers are doing, the differences and areas they wanted to learn from, and where we in the private sector could help them. So I'm going to make mine short, but I am with the Borlaug Foundation. I'm also the vice president of communications and public relations for Anari. I mean, I'm bio now, and we work in plant health. So I'm gonna turn it over and let each of the panelists um, introduce himself. And we're gonna start with Karsten Herbert. Yeah, hi everyone. And uh, once again, thanks for the, the chance to be on the panel. I guess uh, I'm Christian Hebert from Mooseman, Saskatchewan, kind of in the middle of nowhere, Canada. We run, uh, we own and operate a 28,000 acre grain, grain farm focusing on canola, malt barley, wheat, oats, peas, and fall rye. Um, you know, when it comes to the Climate Positive Leaders Program and, and the panel, to be honest, I have, a, I have a legacy statement that hangs on my wall that says our goal is to leave our land, the industry, and our financial statements in a better state generation to generation. I've got a nine-year-old son, Bentley, and a seven-year-old daughter, Ivy, that uh, I hope are kicking me out of the CEO seat at a pretty young age. So all our decisions are, are really based on, on making our farm a legacy farm and, and providing you know, nutritious, safe food to every consumer in the world, but most of all to my own kids. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you. And Alvio, could you go next? Oh, you okay, my name is Abilio Pacheco. I'm a farmer here in Brazil and a rapid researcher who work with integrated forest agriculture system. And we have been getting some good results that I will show you during my presentation, answer the question that will be made. Well, thank you. And Roger, can we go to you? Yeah, uh, good afternoon. I'm Roger Wolf. I'm the director for the Iowa Soybean Association Research Center for Farming Innovation. That's quite a mouthful. Uh, here at the Iowa Soybean Association, we're the largest state-based row crop commodity association in the U.S. Uh, we have about 10 million acres of the soybean production annually. And at the research center, uh, we do um, really active programs that uh, help farmers with their productivity, profitability, and sustainability. And I guess how I got involved in this is I nominated one of our farmers here in Iowa, uh, Ray and Chris Gasser, uh, a father-son team, uh, uh, really that whole legacy thing that uh, uh, Christian uh, mentioned is really important, but probably more than anything is the importance of having the farmer voice uh, first and foremost about all the practices and, and uh, leadership that they're taking on their farm to make a difference in the, you know, making their farm viable, but also uh, contributing to the, the larger community as a whole. So anxious to uh, share thoughts on the questions. Well, thank you. And Mary, we'll go to you next. Thank you. I'm Mary Gums. I am the agronomy manager for the Eastern Corn Belt for the Pioneer brand. And uh, I work with our field agronomy teams uh, doing on-farm research trials and uh, working with farmers on, on improving their operations and improving their sustainability. So my role in the uh, Climate Positive Leaders Program was I was asked to be one of the judges uh, for, the, for the regional uh, results. And so thank you for having me here today. Wonderful. Well, we're going to move in next to, we're going to have two questions that we're going to discuss. So we're going to move in next to our first question. But I did want to call out that this was a global 
um, program, and you can see Australia, Brazil, Canada, Kenya, and the United States are represented. And of course, today we have Canada, Brazil, and the United States. So we do have many different climatic zones and many different issues and needs. So this has been a wonderful experience to learn from all of you. So I'm gonna to turn to question one, and that's talking about transformation. And what in sustainability and climate, what, sustain, what with sustainability and climate positive steps have you taken or your organization taken during this past year to meet the growing demand for global food supply? And I'm going to start with Alvio first. It's me. Yeah. Okay, concerning the positive aspect for the climate, the following management practices have been carried out on my farm, Calibo Vereda Farm, and many other research activity on my organization, Embrapa. I would like to briefly mention some positive steps. First one, the implementation of the Crop Livestock Forestry, ICLF, integration system, a regional and sustainable system for the use and management of natural resources that integrate intercropping of trees, agricultural crops, soybeans, corn, and millet, forage crops, and animals, production of beef, installed and managed simultaneously in sequentially on time and space. With the adoption of the ICLF system, the following development were transformed into management practices. Second one, the arboreal component contributes more significantly for carbon dioxide retention carbon stock, the use of nutrient located on deeper soil layer, the control of the effect of the wind on the water component of the system, increasing animal welfare because of greater thermal comfort in addition. There is great efficiency in the use of fertilizer found in the pasture, animal manure, given that the trees also benefits from them as well as possible increasing a DAFC found with lots of benefits to the soil plant system. In the general, there is improvement in the use of the natural resource and inputs due to the complementarity and synergy between the components of the ICLF system. Third one, the reduction of soil compactation and erosion with progressive attenuation of the impact of the rain and increasing in litter levels. There is also an improvement in the physical, chemical, and biological attributes of the soil, with consequent improvement in the soil productivity and capacity. That's all. Thank you so much. And, and I do want to um, uh, mention Embrapa, which is a phenomenal organization and was near and dear to my grandfather's heart. So thank you for all you do. Uh, we're going to turn to Mary now. So Mary, what's sustainable? Uh, climate positive steps have Corteva taking and some of the farmers you're working with taken? Well, Julie, Corteva overall has really taken sustainability to heart. And we have a lot of official initiatives to promote our 2030 sustainability goals. But one thing that I see on my team of agronomists is the integration of sustainability into our everyday agronomic advice. Uh, one point of the pioneer long look is that we give our customers helpful management advice. And that's not just a hybrid or a variety recommendation anymore. It's making sure that farmers are aware of good stewardship practices, uh, say, uh, conservation of nitrogen, such as nitrogen monitoring, variable rate application, using nitrification inhibitors, uh, making sure they're aware of uh, revenue sources from carbon sequestration, or agronomic practices uh, that make uh, cover crops and no-till more profitable. It's subtle because there are a lot of sustainability, sustainability practices that are also just very good agronomy. Uh, but we've really been focused on making our field teams aware of sustainability and giving them the resources to understand and promote sustainability. Well, thank you very much. And I'm gonna go to Christian next, and I'm gonna first apologize for um, not pronouncing your name um, the first time. So I am sorry. Um, I know that I remember reading through um, your um, background and that your farm has um, a long legacy of sustainability and climate change. So could you tell us what you are doing? 
Yeah, so I mean, I agree completely with Mary on on things such as, you know, minimum till and variable rate, sectional control, you know, the use of inhibitors, it's stuff that we've been doing for 20, 25 years. I can remember going to variable rate when I was 13 or 14 years old. And I, and I think really probably the part we've really noticed is, is just thinking about our farm different. I mean, we used to be farmers, right? Then I think we kind of moved to, we were a biological manufacturing plant making food, fiber and fuel. And I would say that the real thought now is, you know, we're probably the biggest producers of renewable, renewable, healthy food and renewable energy in the world, i.e. It, it, it's what powers every human body on earth. And so thinking about it that way has maybe changed how we're going about some of our new stuff. So what we focus on now is, is I think we have a huge amount of data in not only in our world, but in our agriculture world, and we're trying to make it all intelligent. And what I mean by that is getting these data sources to the point that we can make live decisions, you know, every second or every minute, or at least every couple of weeks when we're right in season, we only get to grow one crop a year in Canada, but even the rest of the world, two or three crops a year, we have to make changes live. So some, some examples of that is, you know, we're running weather stations that have four foot soil probes to measure the, the soil water capacity and running yield alg algorithms off of that. Right from right now, when we're planning for next year, we can, we can make our nutrient and our yield plants for that and then adjust in season. So if we get more rain, we can more, grow more grain. Therefore, we need to add more nutrients, you know, safely and at the proper time for that crop. So I'd say that's one example of smart data. I think too, that the, the scalability in the world of, of climate positive is pretty important to me. I mean, with the amount of consumers we need to, to take care of, and also in order to become, as I mentioned, kind of an ESG strategy for the world, um, we need to have this to be scalable. So how can we implement these things on large acres, which is where equipment efficiency, et cetera, comes in. You know, we're running algorithms on where, which approach should the equipment go in? What AB line should the GPS be driving it on to maximize, you know, not only the acres per hour, but also, you know, what minimize compaction, minimize fuel use and optimize our output in the end. Um, you know, I could probably go on for hours on this because obviously we're pretty passionate about what we do every day, but I think those would be the main points I'd make and, and that, you know, we also really look to other farmers and the companies we work with to all work together to keep improving these data sets to make smarter decisions every year. Well, thank you so much. And I think we could continue to listen to you for hours. So uh, thank you. And Roger, I want to um, turn to you. But first, I am here at the World Food Prize. And I would like to say that we missed our soy um, lunch today, which is always everything is made out of soy. That's so I, I did have to give you a shout out for that. Well, um, uh, yeah, thanks for including me and, and uh, glad you're here. <laughs> So um, when we talk, when you talk about challenges with sustainability um, and climate change, positive agriculture, what are you doing and what are you seeing? Well, we feel it's very appropriate that um, an association of farmers, uh, you know, I, I have no, um, I'm very clear about who I work for, right? Um, and so uh, we, we um, actively develop programs that work to engage farmers uh, on the issues that are locally relevant to them. And you gotta meet farmers where, where they're at. And, and you have farmers that are early adopters and you have farmers that have a ways to go. And, and uh, so we have very active programming and, and it goes back to this balance between productivity, profitability and sustainability. The good news is I think about um, uh, being climate positive is is that we can do this farmer and farming as a system, um, uh, cropping system, livestock systems, the integration of that, you know, figuring out how to use smart data. I uh, couldn't agree more, uh, but we're in the business of driving continuous improvement and we got to always move that frontier forward. And so we really champion the idea of the farmer voice. And that's one of the reasons we nominated Chris and Ray, because uh, they're always willing to step up. Uh, they they do this work on their farm, and uh, so it's a it's a natural fit. And um, you know we have a big job to do, um, and uh, fortunately uh, we have the ability to do it. Uh, that's the good news. We have the data, the information, and the supply chain. The companies are all supportive, and we're all pulling the rope in the same direction. Wonderful. 
Well, I'm going to move on to our second question, and it's really about transformation in the global food system. So what do we need to learn? What do we need to do to make measurable, impactful results? And before we got on live with all of the audience, um, Christian was talking about the consumer. And so I'd like you to expand on that, on what we need to learn and what we need to do better. Yeah, I think if, if I was to look at it from a 100,000 foot, you know, lens, I'd probably go down the path of, you know, everyone's seen the buzzwords of ESG strategies in virtually every public report you've read in the last three years. I, I may be a weird farmer that I either read the odd report out of public companies, but they obviously affect what I do. So, you know, environmental social governance integration processes are now something that's going to be very important to the world and to the consumer. And kind of what I would urge is that let's make sure we look at that more as a circle of life and that, especially in agriculture, that strategy can be finished in the circle between the farm, the companies, and the consumer. And all three of those groups need to be listened to in the process to ensure, let's be honest, that we optimize it. If we only listen to the companies and, and to the government, policies are going to be way off. They don't they don't have to implement those strategies to the dirt, nor are they, are they the largest consumer of the product in the end. Same thing with the consumer. Obviously, we want to take into consideration everything that they want to feed their family, et cetera. And, but you know, I also want to show them the story that after we've implemented all these steps I talk about, it's pretty normal to see my seven and nine-year-old running through the middle of my crop. You know, and it, it might be as soon as an hour after my sprayer ran through that same crop. But the story hasn't been told and we haven't found ways to relate that between the farmer, you know, companies, policy and the consumer. So, I, just, I you know, I would just say, let's make sure that we listen to everybody. I think communication is actually the number one thing as we go to implement these over the next year, three years or a decade. And, and let's make sure that the, the red tape doesn't get so thick that we can't implement these in the, you know, on the farm, in the dirt and at a scalable enough size, because I don't have a legacy if my land only improves and I go bankrupt, right? It's very important that, that they're financially scalable at the same time as they're the best thing for the land and for the consumer. And, you know, and I can promise you the majority of farms I know and, and our farm, especially, I mean, we consume everything we grow. So we focus very strongly on, on the sustainability of not only our own land, but of our business and of everything we're producing for the world. Well, thank you. And that was a, a wonderful, holistic approach, and especially talking about the entire value chain with your farm. Um, I'm going to go to Roger next. So Roger, what do we need to learn um, to advance and make yeah. more measurable results? You bet. Thanks, Julie. I, I think uh, I agree with, with Christian. Um, and, and I think it's part of that story. Um, uh, relating this to more farmers in terms of uh, advancing climate positive. You know, farmers care first and foremost about the long-term productivity and profitability, as well as the sustainability, and, and have been working on this for generations. Uh, we have a long legacy of this. In Iowa, we know that uh, you either have too much or too little water, and, and you, and you, <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's unpredictable. You can't predict the weather. Um, but we also know, uh, based on research, uh, that the impacts on, on uh, yield and variability can be um, impacted with the management practices that we apply. And, and so evaluating these effects uh, in field management and applying this intelligence um, is leading to outcomes that farmers desire. That's exciting. Uh, there are benefits that can be captured. Uh, so I'm, I'm really optimistic about that. Um, and, and, and using these progressive practices, uh, you're really improving the water supply to the crops across the growing season. And farmers value that response to, the, to, to these practices. So they're climate smart practices uh, that impact the soil, water, and nutrient dynamics, which lead to higher yields, uh, which lead to uh, less variability in the field long term. And so farmers can, can bank on that. And, and we need to tell that story. And that's, that's positive for, for society and the whole industry. So um, it's a systems approach and, and we need to be uh, continuing to advance this. Thank you so much, Mary. I'm gonna to turn to you, but I'm gonna change it up a little for you. Since you were a judge 
And you also are at Corteva and, and you had the opportunity of reading all the submissions. What did you learn that Corteva could do to support the farmers more? Well, Julie, I, I looked at this kind of from um, a little more technical question lens. And as I was reading through the, the, the plans uh, uh, put forth by, by the entrance and reading about some of the amazing things that they were doing on their farm, um, I realized that we need to do more work just to uh, uncover how the, the basics of how soil functional responses are affected by sustainability practices. Um, right now, there, there's a kind of nebulous definition of soil health, and we know it's good, and a general understanding that practices such as cover crops and no-till are good things, but why are they good? Are we measuring the right things in the field, and how can they benefit the farmer? Uh, what, what do they bring to the table? Is it, is it higher yield? Is it lower input costs? Is it more climate resiliency? And once we know more of the why behind soil health, we can start really targeting our actions and products to enhance those those responses and uh, make profitability go hand in hand with sustainability. Uh, my, my alter ego behind, besides being an agronomist is that I'm a farmer's wife. And and that's something that I think we need to we re need to realize so much is that uh, things that we do not only have to be environmentally sustainable, but also financially sustainable and and really get that holistic view of sustainability uh, for our farmers. Well, thank you. And we're going to um, close our second question with Abilio. So what would you say um, we've learned and, and, and what do we need to do for really to impact transformation? Yeah. No production process advanced if it is not valued and properly remunerated. Very good works emanate from idealism, and they are usually well intentioned, but they do not advance. This is because the engine that drives this change is primarily financial, but this is often forgotten. Other change is the general or simple movement, but do not real change. Developing a new way of, way of production in an integrated, sustainable, social, and environmentally friendly manner is not easy economically, but the integrated crop, livestock, forest system is so simple and efficient that there is a great chance of success. These characteristics make it practical and adoptable by the vast majority of farmers in the world, I believe in it. Well, thank you. Um, we're going to, I'm going to move to the closing, but first I, I want to congratulate again, uh, Christian and Abilio on um, being a part of the winning team. We thank you for your submission. We thank you for what you're doing with regenerative agriculture and, and how you're teaching others. One thing I learned through this process is and many of the farmers highlighted how they're learning from the other farmers or they're helping teach the other farmers climate smart agriculture. So please continue to do that and share your stories. Um, Corteva, thank you for giving the opportunity for farmers to shine and highlight and for allowing farmers to focus on how they're doing positive things and where Corteva and everyone else can learn and help um, challenge us on what we're doing to meet the needs and, and helping you have climate smart agriculture. Um, I always wanna remind everyone who's watching that farmers are some of the greatest entrepreneurs. And so that's why it's so important to listen to them and learn from them. Soil is one of the most important parts of farming. So of course they're worried about their soil health. And I often, when I talk to farmers, and I tell them, tell your story. Your story is going to be listened to more than um, the, the private sector or even the public sector because people trust farmers. And, and I hear, well, I'm just a farmer. What can I do? And, and please, I never want to hear I'm just a farmer again. Farmers are responsible for why we were all alive today and play such a critical role in, in nutrition and health and, and everything that we can imagine. So I just wanna thank you. Um, I wanna remind everyone that it's always the farmer. And as my grandfather said, we need to always take it to the farmer, but we also need to listen to the farmer. So 
Corteva, thank you for this platform. Thank you for all who um, were a part of it. And um, good luck on continuing and growing climate positive agriculture. Thank you.